welcome to this episode of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course. I'm your host, James Messer, and in this particular module, we're going to talk about CPU, Central Processing Units. This comes from the exam objectives in 220-601, section 11, where we're going to understand more about the purposes and the characteristics of processors and CPUs. And we'll not only learn about the construction of processors, but we're also going to learn about how they work and how they're made up with their data bus, the address bus, uh, learn about registers internal to the processors, and we'll learn about cache memory and math coprocessors as well. And there's another few topics that we'll talk about as we go through this. CPUs themselves, though, are thought of as being the brain of your computer, that central processing unit. It is the part of the computer that handles a majority of the detailed processing inside the system. And it works like clockwork. In many ways, it works exactly like clockwork. We'll learn more about that in a moment. But this is an extremely complex clock. It is, it is full of very, very tiny little pieces. And we're going to step through what all of those little pieces do in this video model module and one that's following it and learn more about the inside of a central processing unit and how we can take advantage of some of those capabilities and what we should look for. There's a lot of different kinds of processors and you'll find in a single personal computer there's a number of actual processors that are inside the system but really one is the central processing unit. And so as we go through these video modules keep in mind that when we talk about this processor the CPU we're really talking about that one central centralized processor inside the system. Now the CPU cache that's inside a processor, you'll hear this term cache many times and it's used in many different ways. In this video module when we're dealing specifically with CPUs, we're talking about cache memory, how it's associated with that central processing unit. This is very fast memory. In fact, it's very very fast memory in the way that it works. And there are different levels of cache. You'll find that as we look at a processor and how it works that these different levels allow that processor to work very quickly. So when we talk about cache memory with a CPU, we're not talking about one level of cache. We're talking about many different layers. And we'll talk about how that works in a moment. You'll hear this term, level one cache. It's often referred to as L1 cache. It's often on the processor itself. And although if you ever look at a processor, it's just a square block or it's a, a different size block, but it doesn't look like there's a lot of different parts in there. In fact, there's, there's many, many different pieces in there and this level one cache memory is usually right there on the chip and it's uh, often on a per core basis as well. We'll talk about multiple cores in a CPU but just keep in mind that if there is a processing unit there is almost always these days an L1 cache associated with it. Now there's also L2 cache associated with it and this is usually on a per CPU basis. In the early days of caching technology with processors L2 cache was often on the motherboard itself. These days, the L2 cache is on the CPU. You'll find it there. If there is a cache on the motherboard, that's often referred to as L3 cache these days. Now, all of these cache technology terms are relatively generic. The level one, level two, and level three cache could be in different places than what I have here. But generally speaking, this is where we often find a cache when we're referring to a CPU and where it's located. This is a good descriptor of a CPU architecture. It's a very basic block diagram. In reality, a CPU architecture is much more complex than what we're looking at on our screen. But this helps us understand what the basic parts are, at least what we'll need to know for the a certification exam. Now, the first blocks on the left side are two that we were just talking about, this cache. And the reason we have a cache on the CPU itself is because it allows us to greatly speed up the processing times. What will happen is when an ALU, an arithmetic logic unit or a floating point unit needs to gather information, it usually goes out to memory that's on the system board and that's outside the L2 cache. Once we re receive that memory, uh, that information from memory, the caches store a copy of that information. And if those ALUs or FPUs ever need to do any more calculations on that information, it doesn't have to go all the way out to what is a relatively slower memory on the system board. It just gathers it directly from the chip in this cache. That's extremely fast and it's extremely efficient. Allows these processors that we use today to work very, very quickly without having to wait while we're receiving 
information from memory can act on it extremely quickly. The ALU is performing functions and performing calculations, and the FPU works along with it. If you're accustomed to some of the older type systems back in the 286, 386 days, you may recall something called a math coprocessor. This was a separate processor that you would purchase and you would install onto your motherboard. These days, the ability to do calculations with floating points is already integrated into the CPU itself. You don't have to purchase a separate math coprocessor any longer. On the far right part of the screen are registers. And registers are simply a place where we can temporarily store information so that the ALU and the FPU can perform calculations of those. So it's a place to take the memory, uh, the information from memory, put it in a place, put a couple of different kinds of locations here, and perform calculations on those. And there, in reality, there's many, many more registers than the four that I've listed here. But if you ever look at a processor and the way that it works, these are are very four very common registers you'll find an AX, a BX, a CX, and a DX. And so this process takes place of bringing the memory in, putting it into a register, performing calculations on that register, and sending it out again. And that's taking place over and over and over again inside of a central processing unit. If we expand this concept out into a wider view, a type of CPU you'll often see is something called a dual core CPU. What this means is that this process of having this these logic units performing calculations, here's one up here, and there's another exact duplicate on the bottom. You can see it there. And as we look at the architecture, those are two, are two cores that are processing information at exactly the same time. It's almost like having two processors in a single system. What's interesting about that, and the reason that I put it on a separate slide, is notice that each core has its own cache, an L1 cache, on the system. And notice that there's a separate L2 cache that generally is something that is shared between the cores. So as you start looking at some of these newer styles of CPUs and the newer architectures that are out there, you'll see that these dual core technologies are often set up this way, where there is a separate cache per core and then a larger L2 cache that's just outside that handles all of the cores that happen to be on those systems. Today, you have processors that have multiple cores. They might have four cores inside of the system, might have four separate L1 caches, and still one individual L2 cache that handles all four of those cores. Once we need to gather information that's not in the cache, we then we need to go out to system memory. We were talking earlier about how that cache allows a CPU to perform calculations very, very quickly as long as that information has already been gathered from the external bus memory that's out on our motherboard and copied into cache. And so the the CPU doesn't have to go all the way out to the system memory and gather that again. We mentioned that it's a relatively slow process to do that. And that's because the CPU has to jump through the memory controller hub across the front side bus, or the FSB. We talked about the FSB in an earlier module. That bus actually consists of two different pieces. There is an address bus and a data bus. And the way that this works is the CPU is going to request the memory address through the address bus, and so that the, the memory controller hub knows where to grab the information finally from the random access memory. Once it determines what it needs to grab, it sends that information back over a data bus. And you'll notice that the address bus and the data bus may have two different sizes associated with them. Sometimes they're exactly the same size. Both of them might be a 32-bit bus, for instance. But that's not always the case whenever you're looking at that front side bus and the way that the address bus and the data bus are related to each other. Another piece that I put into this diagram is a clock. And I put a picture of a metronome. If you've ever sat in front of a piano or worked with music before, you know that a metronome is there to keep a constant rate so that the all of the systems that are inside your computer all are running across the same clock. And so that it knows the CPU sends this information, it knows when to request, and it knows when to expect to receive information because the clock is keeping time for everything that happens to be in your computer. There's a clock for the CPU, there's a clock for the memory controller hub, and everything happens in step. Everybody's on the same time schedule when we're dealing with these different components inside a CPU and inside the motherboard itself and all of the different components. Now what you're going to find when you start looking at that is you'll see on your motherboard itself the clock. That is a picture right there of a clock that happens to be on my motherboard. And you can see it's running at 40 megahertz.
40.000000 megahertz to be completely accurate here. Well, we know that the CPU that's inside this system is running at 1 gigahertz. So how is a clock that's running so slowly, relatively speaking, keeping up with that? Let's look into that a little bit more. Inside that little device we were looking at is a quartz crystal. It's extremely accurate in the way that it works. It's an analog signal that we have separate chips on our motherboard that convert that analog to digital pulses so that all of the systems stay in time. It's, as, I, as we noticed here, much slower than the actual CPU. That's because the CPU is using something called a multiplier. And for our particular clock that's on this motherboard that runs at 40 megahertz, if I have a 1 gigahertz CPU, which is really 1,000 megahertz, then we know that the multiplier inside the CPU is really 25 times faster than this other quartz crystal that's on the system. The reason that these are separate is because if we wanted to use a different speed CPU, well, that would probably mean that we'd have to then remove this particular quartz crystal and replace it with one. That's a little bit of a problem sometimes. Often you'll find a motherboard will support many different speeds of CPUs. Also keep in mind that the buses that are inside your system are also running at different speeds. The ISA bus is also running at a different speed than your front side bus. And so all of those systems to be able to run at different speeds simply use different multipliers, but they all keep track from exactly the same clock. A CPU also uses different modes to operate. You'll often hear these terms used because this is the way that our operating systems use the CPU. The first mode is called real mode. You'll often hear this referred to as compatibility mode. And that's because this was the first real method that CPUs used to operate back in the 8088, 8086 days. There is no memory protection built into the CPU hardware. Everything is really wide open, which means that one program could perhaps accidentally use memory that was being used by a different program. And as you can imagine, these applications sharing memory that way can create major problems and crash the applications themselves. And that also meant that in the hardware itself, we weren't able to do any type of real multitasking. When processors evolved and introduced in the 286 and really became usable in the 386 chip, we have something called the protected mode. This really launched the ability of Windows and other operating systems to be able to really multitask properly. And what this allowed was that the CPU could now handle this process of multiple applications running at the same time, and it had a way to protect those applications from overwriting each other. Therefore, it's called protected mode. This greatly changed the entire PC platform technology. At this point, Windows was really able to take off as an operating system, and that changed the way we use computers forever. Let's review what we've talked about then. We know that we've gone through exactly how a processor is constructed. We looked at that architecture, and we saw how all of the different buses interacted with each other. We looked at the way cache memory is associated with all of those things, and even went into a little bit of the detail with registers and how the math coprocessor or the floating point unit is now used. And finally, we understood a little bit more about how real mode and protected mode are used inside a computer and how it really changed the way that we're working with our computers today. For more CompTIA A Plus videos, for study guides, for our online message boards, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.